thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Amelia. I'm the secretary of Oxford's branch of Student Young Pugwash, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to the final event of Student Young Pugwash's Festival of Ethical Science. Um, we've had sessions throughout November all around this idea of ethical science, um, most of which are now on YouTube if you'd like to watch them back. Um, and this session will be recorded and posted on YouTube as well. For today's event, we have two brilliant speakers bringing different perspectives on the interactions between science and indigenous peoples. If you have questions throughout, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen, um, as well as time for questions following both our speakers' talks. Um, our first speaker tonight, Hilding Nielsen, is Mi'kmaq and a member of the Halipu First Nation of Newfoundland. He is a contract assistant professor in the David A. Dunlap Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on the details of stellar, stellar physics in both sun-like stars and massive stars. At the same time, his work aims to indigenize astrophysics in Canada by creating a space for indigenous cosmologies and worldviews and by using indigenous methodologies to study astronomy. Our second speaker, Riley Tating Fong, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Communication at San UC San Diego. Her, her interdisciplinary research draws on science studies and native Pacific cultural studies to understand the impacts of emerging technologies on indigenous communities, lands, and resources. Her current project looks at proposals to trial engineering technologies on islands throughout Oceania um, and considers the role of community engagement in facilitating indigenous oversight of these technologies. Riley has published about this work in the journal Human Biology. So thank you both of you for joining us. And now over to Dr. Nielsen. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's customary in Canada when we're giving talk to do a land acknowledgement. In a virtual world, this is kind of funny, but uh, so I just want to acknowledge where I'm speaking from. I'm currently in Toronto, which is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas, and the Wendat. The people have lived on this land for since time immemorial, and it's a land on our place on it is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. So it's a great honor to be able to speak from this land as, as a Indigenous person, but not, not on my own territory. It is very valuable to be in the city where indigenous peoples from all around the world exist, live and coexist together. As noted, I am Mi'kmaq uh, from Newfoundland, but the people who are Mi'kmaq live across Eastern Canada. And this is one of the things I find very lovely about being here is the idea of the Pugwash Society named after Pugwash in Nova Scotia. So the whole society in the first meeting was, was done on Mi'kmaq territory in the lands of the Mi'kmaq peoples. I want to speak to you a little bit today about what it means to be Indigenous in astronomy and how we can change uh, astronomy to be more respectful of Indigenous peoples and more open. In Canada, the Indigenous peoples make up about 6% of the population and are normally characterized, characterized by three groups. You, in the far north, we have the Inuit people, and the Inuit live across northern Canada, northern US, uh, Russia. In across the main part of the continent are the First Nations. Um, sometimes people call them Native Americans. The First Nations peoples exist from, from Newfoundland to BC, so Mi'kmaq, Cree, Anishinaabe, Blackfoot, and so on. And then there's also the Metis First Nations, or Metis Nations, which is a more recent kind of development as a mix of early settlers and indigenous peoples who developed their own, grew their own cultures before the main threat of colonization. Indigenous voices are incredibly important in astronomy. And I view it this way in that, I don't know how many people have taken an astronomy course, but if you read a traditional astronomy textbook, you'll start with the Greek astronomers, Aristotle, Aristophanes, Pythagoras, and we'll just, Stroll through the story of heroes from, from there to Ptolemy, Copernicus, Rahe, Kepler, Newton, and so on. And there's a, almost a direct line between Aristotle and Neil deGrasse Tyson for how we view astronomy. But this ignores numerous cultures and peoples from around the world, not just indigenous peoples, but Korean peoples, Chinese peoples, uh, Hindu peoples. Much of the Islam, there's a huge gap in our study from when we talk about the Ptolemaic model of the solar system to Copernicus, where the Islamic Caliphate essentially maintained and built that structure of both the solar system and understanding the data. 
So in, in this current sense, we're very much exclusive of many different voices and perspectives. And you know, one of the key issues is we want people to see themselves as scientists, but if most of our scientists are the same old white man trope, how can many people do that? And I say that as someone who's ostensibly an old white man. <clears throat> and so when we bring this back to indigenous peoples, particularly in Turtle Island, which is North America, looking at some of the ways of knowing, and there's no one pan indigenous way of knowing. Every nation, people has their own sort of understandings of the cosmology and the universe, but they come to it in different ways and there's some commonalities. One of the commonalities is that there's connections between the sky we see above and the land below, and that is a reflection. So our knowledge is linked intrinsically to the land. In this way, we tell stories in the night sky that tell us about the land, and we'll tell stories about constellations that last throughout the year, the stories told across one year. But that story is very different if I'm in uh, Pugwash, Nova Scotia, versus if I'm in Sydney, Australia, because the views of the skies are very different. And that connection, so maintaining that connection to the land and through the sky is also important for remembering that this land is indigenous. In that this land, because this land is indigenous, we need to respect that. We, need, we should be learning about that as settlers or guests on this land. Another key um, way of knowing is knowledge is, we sort of treat knowledge in the Western system or Eurocentric system or the standardized system, whatever you want to refer to it, as a noun. It's something we earn, it's something we, we get, something we develop. But for many indigenous people, knowledge is relational, it's a verb, it's action, it's what we do. And that knowledge as a relation means that when I observe something, it's actually very much related to the observer. Now, we might talk about that in quantum mechanics, for instance, where you know, if you observe a particle, it depends on when and who's doing the observations, and that's somewhat true. But it's also more broader scale. Uh, one of my favorite ideas is the cosmological anthropic principle. That's a big phrase, which just simply means this universe is too good to be true. If we look at things like the, strong, the forces of nature and how they interact, if they were slightly different in strength relative to each other. We cannot, atoms cannot exist, we cannot exist, this universe wouldn't exist. Which means this sort of suggests that we're in a special place in this universe. And the idea of we, we being special is completely painful for many astronomers and physicists who, who want to be the objective observer. We want to, we live in an axiom where the universe doesn't really care about us. It does what it does. But if the universe is this perfect, we seem to have a relation to it. So one way to get around that is we develop a theory of the multiverse where there's infinite number of universes and different number of combinations, which is nice, but there's no evidence of that. It's just a nice, a nice story we tell to make us, to help us sleep at night. But if knowledge is relational in indigenous senses, well, then that's okay. We don't need more universes. This is what it is, which may not be satisfactory, but it could be, could be just as true. In many senses also, we talk about nature in a very different sense in a Western tradition versus many indigenous traditions. And in one sense, this is a hierarchy in the Western traditions where humans are the apex and you know, we control everything, whether it's through hunting, farming, drug trials, pets versus a non-hierarchical sense in which many animals, mammals, birds are all relation, are relations. And that may not be in the same way when I think of cousins, but it's that kind of familial sense. We're not in a, we're, we have no more rights to the land or place than any of the animals or species or plants for that matter. That creates a sense of, in terms of science, it's a little bit different. Uh, one way I think about this is through ideas like the Drake equation. So the Drake equation is this great thought experiment asking how many other civilizations exist in our galaxy? And so this was done by Frank Drake, not the rapper. It'd be more interesting if it were the rapper, but it was Frank Drake. And he basically went through a whole bunch of different thought processes. And, you know, how many stars can have planets? How many planets can host life? How many of those planets hosting life can host intelligent life? How many of those with the cousin life can create civilizations and that are detectable by us? And how long do they last? And the key words in this is intelligent life, civilizations, 
how, how long do they last? Because we're, if you think from a non-hierarchical sense, well, intelligent life could be anything from humans to dolphins, to dogs, to everything on earth. Everything on earth has its own intelligence at some level. And it becomes less anthropocentric or less human-centric if we do it this way. The other part of the equation that is very technocentric. You know, Frank Drake developed this equation, the height of the Cold War. So, you know, when he did this, he thought a length of a civilization was probably possibly determined by how long it takes before they make themselves blow up, blow themselves up with nuclear weapons. Today, we might talk about it, how long before we destroy ourselves through climate change. But, you know, the Mi'kmaq people, my people, have been on Turtle Island for tens of over 10,000 years versus a technological society that's 100 years. How do things change when we start thinking in these different kind of axioms? You know, maybe there are, we might think from a Frank Drake sense that if we think very techno, techno-centric, there might be very few civilizations in our galaxy. But if we think from a more indigenous perspective, life might be everywhere. It probably is. I mean, even... There was even a short-lived claim to the possibility of life on Venus, which was really cool. And it didn't really work out, but you never know. So this kind of changes how we think of in terms of ethics and I think in astronomy. We focus so solely on this Western sense in astronomy that we're kind of stuck. And this impacts how we do our sciences. For one thing, astronomers love telescopes. We want the biggest, baddest, meanest telescopes in the world, and we're going to build them. And where, where do we build them? On indigenous territories. Canada is a partner in the 30 meter telescope with uh, parts of the United States, Japan, and India, which we want to build this 30 meter diameter telescope on Mauna Kea, which is of significance to uh, Kanaka Mole or Native Hawaiian. As well. And there's already 13 other telescopes there. The European Southern Observatory, which is a treaty organization of many European countries, are building a 40 meter telescope in Northern Chile. Another American project within Australia is being built in Chile. We're part of a one kilometer square, one square kilometer array of radio telescopes that are being built in South Africa and Australia, as well as another radio telescope that's being expanded in North Southern United States. For those of you who remember the class movie contact, the radio telescopes pointing in space, we're just going to make a way bigger version of that. And so we're crossing indigenous lines everywhere. And this has been a problem for us, or becoming a problem for us, though it's been a much far longer problem that on Mauna Kea, Native Hawaiians are saying no. They're saying we don't want the telescope because Mauna Kea is important. It's both spiritually important, economically important, culturally important, it's just important. And this has led to protests, uh, arresting of elders. And I met one of the elders later on. This was a, a 75 year old man, a little bit petite, and could charm the socks off anyone. He was about as dangerous, he's about as, dangerous as, as a puppy, but they arrested him. And so we have to understand that ethic. How do we deal with being astronomers and working with indigenous on indigenous lands. How do we deal with being astronomers and working with indigenous communities? And we're not doing a very good job at this point. Um, we maybe we'll learn, maybe we won't as a, as a broader astronomy community. But it's also, so we're failing on land. And if we want to be inclusive of indigenous peoples, we need to be considered of a land. We also need to be considered of the persons. We want indigenous peoples to be in STEM, because it's 6% of the population, less than 0.5% less than at faculty level, almost no students in physics. And we want indigenous knowledge, and we need all three to be properly inclusive. I mean, if we just took indigenous knowledge without the people, we're just appropriating knowledge. If we, do, if we take the people without the knowledges, we're just assimilating people, it's just colonization all over. And so it's very interesting and very important because we take, then we, if we have all of them, we can embrace indigenous stories, broader diversity of ways of learning and be more considerate of the place we're on. And this has benefits for non-indigenous peoples. You know, I, I always roll my eyes because one of my favorite movies of all time is the movie 2012, where the world blows up because of solar neutrinos. But that's 
based on the silly prophecy that because the Mayan calendar ended, oh my God, the world is going to end. And it was, which is just a complete dismissal of indigenous knowledge of the science. It wasn't the end of a Mayan calendar any more than December 31st is the end of our calendar. So if we start embracing indigenous knowledge and respecting them, maybe we won't jump to that conclusion. Maybe if we start respecting indigenous knowledge and the peoples, we won't, we'll take away the space that leads to things like ancient aliens. Now, how many people watch ancient aliens and, and, and see people say, well, the pyramids were built by aliens. Stonehenge was built by aliens. This was built by aliens. As if humans are incapable of ever doing anything themselves. And particularly this is damaging to indigenous peoples because it, for, it, sorry, it, st it steals from their stories, whether indigenous peoples who are star people or indigenous peoples who came from the land. You know, it, and it takes the English version of the stories and just sort of rips it apart and creates this great conspiracy theory. So it'd be perfect. We want, we want to do this to be ethical and to be better. Um, so thank you for letting me have my rant. It was a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I think I'll pass it back to Amelia. Um, thank you so much. Um, Hilton, and now over to Riley, who's going to talk about um, biology. Okay, let's share the screen. Half a day, everyone. Hello, uh, my name is Riley Tiding Fong. I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Communication here at UC San Diego. Um, I'm going to talk to you about this emerging technology called gene drive and sort of um, ethical issues related to um, picking up on some of the themes from Hilding's talk, um, indigenous knowledge and sort of experimentation on indigenous lands. Uh, to orient you a bit to my background, um, I am European on my mother's side and I am Chamorro on my father's side. Uh, for those who don't know, Chamorros are the indigenous peoples of the island of Guahan or Guam. And I am joining you today from uh, UC San Diego, where I currently live on the unceded lands of the Kumeyaay Nation. So um, it's also where Chamorros have one of our biggest diasporic homes um, while living in this role as settlers on Kumeyaay lands. So um, I share this with you to kind of orient you to my background and also to point out that, you know, as a diasporic Chamorro, I'm attuned to the role of settler colonialism and militarism in you know, disrupting our access to our ancestral lands um, and shaping our migration. And so this in turn sort of motivates my uh, commitment to bringing conversations about indigenous self-determination to the space of science, um, which as this audience is probably well aware has these deep entanglements with settler colonialism and militarism. And so let's get into it. Uh, the title of my talk today is Islands as Laboratories, Indigenous Knowledge and Gene Drives in the Pacific. And uh, so I'll be talking to you about my dissertation work and I'm gonna kind of give you just a brief glimpse into it. And I'll start with a background on gene drives. So kind of give you a tune up on what this technology is. And then I will talk about you know, what I mean when I say islands as laboratories in the context of this emerging technology. And then I'll close with a few reflections on community engagement. Okay. So um, for those who haven't heard of gene drive, gene drives are techniques of genetic modification uh, and they work by pushing or driving a particular modification through an entire species. And so gene drives themselves aren't necessarily new. There are you know, naturally occurring gene drives in most organisms. Um, but what is new and really unprecedented is the way scientists today are using genome editing tools like CRISPR-Cas9 um, to create gene drives. And so I'll say a little bit more about this with some pictures I drew. And um, so let's imagine you have a genetically modified mouse and it mates with a wild type mouse. Now under typical rules of inheritance, so think Mendel and his pea plants and Punnett squares, uh, you're gonna see about a 50% chance of offspring inheriting that modification. But with gene drive, um, this changes significantly. So CRISPR-based gene drives work by making precise cuts to the wild type allele, then repairing it with an engineered version containing the drive, 
so that all or nearly all of the offspring will contain that drive allele. So what this means is that genetic modifications can be spread to entire populations of sexually reproducing organisms um, with really sort of unprecedented, unprecedented speed and efficacy. And this is considered for this reason, both a major breakthrough and a cause for concern. And so there's a lot of applications, uh, potential applications of gene drive, um, you know, spanning public health and conservation and agriculture. Uh, gene drives are being developed in the laboratory as a tool to eradicate or suppress populations of mosquitoes that vector diseases to humans like Zika or malaria. And there's also work being done to use gene drive to immunize mice against Lyme's disease. And specifically in Oceania, there are some ways that gene drives could intervene in various sort of intractable issues spanning um, conservation and public health. So for example, there's a lot of interest in um, you know, using gene drive to um, facilitate invasive species management. So you know, we have issues with rodents sort of wreaking havoc on our island ecosystems. Also um, in Hawaii, there's interest in using gene drive to suppress or eradicate uh, populations of, of the Culex quinquefasciatus mosquito that vectors avian malaria to endemic endangered birds such as EEV um, or the scarlet honey creeper, which you see pictured here. And so this is a conversation that is, um, you know, taking on a lot of interest in context of these larger issues of climate change as well. Um, as we see climate change warming our planet, we can expect the threats to you know, endangered species like EEV uh, intensifying, right? So hotter temperatures mean that mosquitoes are able to survive at the higher elevations where these birds live. So we can expect to see that disease transmission expanding and then also intensifying at those lower elevations. There's also interest in using a gene drive to engineer coral reef resilience to warming waters, and then a range of public health issues that are particular to Oceania, so vector-borne disease, neglected tropical disease, things like dengue and chikungunya, among others. So all this to say, there's a lot of you know, hype and material investment into bringing gene drive out of the lab where it currently is and into the field for these types of interventions. But of course, there are a number of really vexing and significant ethical issues that would have to be, you know, grappled with or kind of worked out before that could happen or happen safely. And so I'll talk about a few of these. Like one big one that comes up is pub <clears throat> public acceptance. So, you know, there's wide acknowledgement that in order for a technology like gene drive to ever make it out of the lab and into the field, it needs to have some degree of public acceptance, of course, questions about, you know, how you do this are still being grappled with. There's also questions about regulation. How best do you regulate genetically modified organisms containing a gene drive? You know, who gets to decide that they're safe for release and how? Um, how do we deal with the inevitable fact of transboundary movement, i.e. a gene drive mosquito isn't going to sort of respect our arbitrary political boundaries, uh, regardless of whether neighboring nations, you know, might have different feelings about gene drive. A big one is sort of these uncertainties surrounding the potential impacts on ecosystems, right? It's unclear how modified organisms containing gene drive will affect ecologies, you know, what downstream effects might occur. So uh, what's more is that some gene drives are designed to endlessly self-propagate, so we're talking about, you know, in theory, um, a single gene drive organism could perhaps, you know, uh, initiate changes on a global scale with potentially irreversible impacts. Another one is sort of these uh, concerns around what, what are called dual use issues sometimes, right? So technologies that could be used for good or intentionally misused for harm. Um, you know, it's been pointed out if a gene drive can be engineered to or suppress the spread of a disease. In theory, it could be engineered to spread disease or maybe coordinate attacks on crops or things like that. So, um, and this is one reason we actually see a lot of military investment in, in this country into research on gene drive and how to contain it. And then finally, you know, the very high stakes associated with the unintentional release um, and spread of gene drive means there's a lot of emphasis on how best to contain these organisms, 
uh, until we've worked out some of these issues. So this brings me to the second part of my talk and where islands tend to really enter the broader discourse on gene drive risk management. And so some of the same organizational bodies that publish major guidance framework literature, you know, the World Health Organization, National Academies of Science about um, genetically modified organisms, including with gene drive, some of these organizations are making these sort of explicit claims to the potential use of islands as, you know, ideal testing locations for gene drive, right? Ideal isolated contained settings um, to limit the dispersal and minimize the chance of impact outside the trial area. So, um, and I mentioned, you know, there are particular projects sort of an interest in using gene drive for um, issues that are kind of particular to islands, but um, there is also this broader sort of narrative about using islands as a sort of experimental setting um, on the path to a different, maybe more continental endpoint, right? And so this is sort of what I'm highlighting here. And within these conversations, it's really, you know, largely taken for granted this description of an island being a sort of distant, isolated, uh, ideal site for this type of experimentation. And this is a perspective I want to point out that has, you know, a relatively short genealogy when compared to oceanic relations to islands that go back millennia. So, you know, not to brag, but Pacific Islanders um, have been some of the greatest voyagers um, in history, right? Our people have been great creators and users of technology that allowed us to settle our islands, you know, using the stars and the waves and the birds. And, when you have this kind of expert and intimate relation to the ocean and the late and great Apelli Ha'opa has famously pointed this out, the ocean isn't understood as something that disconnects or isolates us, but rather something that connects us and really serves you know, as a pathway and a life force. And so thinking of islands in that sort of Western way, right, isolated, distant, far flung, is actually a much more recent myth and invention in history. And of course, one motivated by very particular imperial goals. So Elizabeth Deluri of UCLA puts it very cogently in her article, The Myth of the Isolate. And she points out, you know, islands have long captured the attention and interest of colonizers looking uh, to extract natural resources, uh, scholars fascinated by what they perceive as, you know, natural laboratories, right, be it of evolution or of human culture. And in these views, islands are treated as these bounded units of analysis. And in these views, their isolation sort of is understood as rendering them contained, right? And now there's another context in which this move to equate remoteness with containment um, has deep roots in harrowing outcomes. And this is, of course, military experimentation in Oceania. And again, one that folks in this audience will certainly recognize. And so, you know, views of islands as remote and isolated were indeed the very basis of justification for the hundreds of nuclear explosions conducted in Oceania by American and British and French governments throughout the Cold War. And so looking at this map um, by Gens and colleagues of nuclear explosions since 1945, um, the circles indicate the size of the detonations, the colors, the country that conducted the test, and the dotted circle I added to kind of demarcate um, tests that have occurred in Oceania, and to also call our attention to the particular nuclear history uh, of the Marshall Islands or French Polynesia. And so for instance, the Castle Bravo test of 1954 was the most powerful atmospheric test ever conducted by the US uh, and took place at Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. And Bravo has been described by researchers as equivalent to 1000 Hiroshima's. So, Again, you know, how we see the harms uh, justified under this logic of isolation. And we know the health effects of radiation exposure in these regions have, you know, contributed to thyroid disease and cancers and reproductive issues, um, including transgenerationally. So both as a result of direct uh, radiation exposure and exposure to fallout in the um, soil and food. And so, you know, this is, I know I don't have to sell y'all on this, like this is a really egregious violation of, of human rights. And again, justified under these 
colonial logics of the continent as the center and islands as the periphery and as sort of disposable uh, spaces for experimentation, right? And so also I'll point out, you know, of course, Marshallese today continue to experience some of these consequences, but also are importantly actively resisting this type of um, militarism and continued contamination and experimentation of, of their lands. And so in the last few minutes here, I just wanna conclude, and maybe I can leave some of this for sort of the Q&A, but I wanna conclude with some of my work and thinking around the role of community engagement in this space, perhaps as a way to facilitate indigenous self-determination, um, but also, you know, kind of highlight some of the challenges and actually seeing that that happens. And so I will acknowledge that in this space, something that is sort of encouraging is that there is conversation about the importance of public or stakeholder engagement. And um, some of this literature is even pointing specifically to the importance of engaging local and or indigenous communities, right? So we can be encouraged by this, but of course, there's still a lot of conversation to be had about what engagement is and how to do it in this space, right? And so a couple of reflections I'll just leave you with from work I've done, um, both you know, critically reading the literature on engagement in this space and also interviewing folks, um, scientists and indigenous folks kind of working in this space um, are these. So first that, you know, not all engagement is created equal. A lot of what we see in engagement activities that are sort of emerging in this space tend to default to these more, um, you know, unidirectional forms of engagement, right? You could think science education, you know, educating lay people on uh, what gene drive is. And in, in large part, this is, I think, motivated by um, presumptions that the more knowledge people have about technology, the less resistant they'll be to it. And what this does is really take the conversation off of these important issues of sovereignty and self-determination and instead make it an issue of, of education. So the recommendations I've written about in um, my paper in human biology on this topic and elsewhere in my dissertation really focus on, you know, how can we use engagement to instead ground in the goal of indigenous self-determination rather than the goal of authorization. Right? How can we pursue more reciprocal models of engagement wherein communities are treated as partners with valid expertise um, and perspectives that you know, should be included in this deliberation? And how do we integrate indigenous knowledge and values? So for instance, what are we identifying as a risk or a benefit in these risk assessment type activities? Um, you know, I would argue and many would argue that you need to actually be engaging the people who experience the consequences of these decisions in defining what constitutes a risk or a benefit. So, and the very last thing I'll say on this is that um, there's a lot of great inspirational work to draw from, from indigenous scholars around the world, uh, some of whom I've highlighted here, you know, this spans the topics of indigenous data sovereignty, um, genomics research with indigenous communities. I've highlighted Diné scholar, Katrina Claw and colleagues paper um, in nature here. And then also Maui Hudson from Aotearoa, New Zealand has done a lot of excellent work thinking specifically about indigenous perspectives in this space of gene drive research. And so I'll end there. And I just wanna say a big sign of Masse, special thank you to Amelia and Andrew and the Student Young Pugwash Org and my colleagues who have supported this work. Thank you. Thank you, both of our speakers. Um, so now we have time for anyone in the audience. If you have any questions, um, you should be able to type them into the Q&A box. Um, and while we're waiting for anyone else, I guess I'll start. So, um, you know, Riley, you listed some other suggestions of other things people could read if they're interested in this. Um, Elding, are there any recommendations you'd have for other ways that we could learn about indigenizing astronomy since, um, or physics in general, since this is clearly a very wide topic. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. There's a lot of questions, or sorry, a lot of resources available in different places. Um, there are books like Blackfoot Physics, which is written by a science popularizer, for instance. 
And there are lots of indigenous stories of the night sky online. Uh, in terms of professionalizing astronomy, it's actually not a whole lot of work that's been done outside of the uh, archeological or anthropological sphere. Uh, as part of the, both Canada and the US for astronomy both undergo decadal, process, uh, decadal reviews of the field. So we're in the process of a decadal review now where we're planning what Canadian astronomy wants to do in the next decade. And so we've actually put forward some new recommendations there. Uh, one in terms of uh, how Canada should participate in Mauna Kea um, through the lens of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as opposed to which we're doing now, which is whatever we want. Mm -hmm. And another is about indigenizing astronomies, which involves developing scholarships and camps. And one of the biggest problems we have in physics, there is almost no indigenous people in physics. We have very little indigenous, indigenous community research in terms of physics and astronomy, largely driven by the perspective that physics is some sort of absolute truth. And so therefore indigenous, including indigenous peoples won't really do anything other than diverse, the standard diversity. Uh, I think so really it's a lot of is is trying to educate uh, professional physicists and astronomers to be more inclusive and more open about these stories and what we can learn from them. And so we've been doing that for the last few years. Um, and there's some good, good work going on as part of the, in the US, United States as part of the Kale survey and doing that um, in the APS, uh, Gazette, the American Physics Society. Uh, my colleague, uh, Brittany Kamai, published a paper discussing the development of the new uh, Society of Indigenous Physicists and some of the things that my colleagues are doing across the US and uh, Canada. Thank you. Um, again, if anyone else has any questions, you can, oh, we have one. Um, asking Riley, how do you address in your recommendations the economic dependence of the islands on regional powers? I'm also curious if you have any insights on the growing activity of China and even Taiwan in the Pacific Islands. Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. So how do I address the economic dependence of islands on regional power? So I'll answer this from the sort of perspective of militarism in my own work. And I think that's like about the extent that I can address this question. But um, yeah, I, I would say a lot of um, my own focus in sort of trying to advance these goals of indigenous sovereignty and self-determination are, you know, predicated on these larger projects of decolonization and demilitarization. Um, of course, a lot of the sort of reason we see um, Pacific islands like Guahan, like Hawaii and others throughout um, Oceania having these issues of dependence has to do with these deep histories of militarism and you know military buildup that continues in on our islands. So um, a lot of what we're looking at in you know projects um, kind of bringing together these cross solidarity movements um, both here locally in San Diego but also throughout the Pacific have to do with you know um, resisting sort of military appropriations and decisions about our lands. So. Um, on Guam and throughout the Marianas, this has to do with, you know, active political organizing to resist the continued military buildup um, on our island, you know, about two thirds of our island is already occupied by the military. Um, and more locally in Kumeyaay Nation here, sort of resisting these, um, the buildup with the, the border wall, which cuts through Kumeyaay Nation. So um, I would just highlight, you know, thinking about uh, this sort of project, larger project of demilitarization is, is really fundamental to um, more specific questions about how we can advance self-determination in these spaces. And speaking of military, we have like some jet, jets flying over my head right now. <laughs> you can hear the noise pollution in the back. Um, are there any other? Okay. Um, from Melanie, does indigenized spaces means to recognize the current state of emergency we are in in terms of the planet? Um, if so, which are the methods that are currently being used to highlight the importance of indigenous people protecting 80% of biodiversity worldwide? Um, I'm not sure which of you this was aimed at. Um, 
Would you mind repeating the question or maybe uh, pasting it in the Q&A so we can read it? Um, she can, can you see the Q&A? It should be there. Perhaps I could start from a Canadian perspective. Currently in Canada, there's right now multiple issues, um, confrontations between indigenous communities and police. And Nova Scotia is the name of asserting fishing rights and uh, settler fishermen basically burning boats. And uh, Ontario where I'm at is rights over expanding reserve land. And in British Columbia, it is a fight over a pipeline to, that's cutting through these territories. My personal feeling about this is there's one is that we shouldn't be asking Indigenous people to do the work of protecting 80% of the biodiversity. It, we're the, we as in the West are the ones who did the damage. We need to do the work and do the leadership. And I think the best way of going forward is to help Indigenous peoples uh, with through things like the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples through treaties to have their own sovereignty and their own leadership and decide what they need is best for them. And that may be a pipeline through their territories or maybe military base, that's up to them. I think it is us in the West and Canadian governments, American governments and other governments is responsible to do this work on protecting biodiversity as well. Um, we depended on indigenous people to do this work for way too long and it's, it's, a, it's a hard burden and one that is can be potentially damaging, particularly when indigenous interests do not necessarily agree with environmentalists. We have another one. Um, I was wondering if either speaker could talk about indigenous knowledge in outer space. I have, uh, I know some have made arguments that discourse around space exploration reflects ideas of settler colonialism. How can we deal with this? Shall I? Um, I this is, this could be a whole other rant. Um, to be honest, our discussion of, of outer space exploration and colonization is literally falling out of the American West. Every book discussion almost invariably uses the same terms, stories, and analogies to people, to pioneers in the West, and ignoring and the ideas of terra nullis, the idea that nobody's land it uses ideas of manifest destiny, and we actually have a huge significant problem with this because we're so stuck on this, even through the idea, through the lens of Elon Musk, who's, who wants to send people to Mars in some sort of vein of a James Bond villain. So we have a huge problem. We need to change this discourse. We need to change the voices in terms of space exploration because it is largely driven by, by the, the wealthy entrepreneurs today or nationalism in the last 20 years, i.e. the military. And it does not represent indigenous peoples and does not represent the land. And then not, this comes in more important is the thing about this, do we have a right to put settlements and build stuff on the moon or on Mars? We haven't, we haven't actually proven there's no life on Mars. So are we, so when we go to Mars, we actually have to assume some level of terra nullis or Martian nullis. We have to use the same thought processes that we use to justify colonization in Turtle Island, in the Pacific Islands, here in Australia, to do this. And we're, kind of, we're still stuck there. And we haven't actually found ethical ways to think about this more clearly and more succinctly. So yeah, um, I think we need to have indigenous people in the conversation and we need to essentially cancel certain words. I think we need to find ways to get rid of words like colonization, terraforming, and basically anything that's very anthropocentric. I don't know, Riley would like to add to it. 
Um, we also have another question in the chat box at the moment um, saying to both presenters, thank you for your presentations today and for your work. These are deeply important topics. Indigenous self-determination and sovereignty are vital, but unfortunately many governments are resistant to facilitating this, i.e. in Australia where I'm from. I wonder whether there have been any success stories to your knowledge where indigenous communities in the Pacific or North America have been empowered to steer or shape specific scientific projects we can, who we can look to for inspiration and learning. Um, so. Sure, I can, I can start in on that. It's a great question, thank you. Um, I would say first, like, you know, these are really, harrowing fights at times to be a part of, right? Fighting for independence or decolonization or demilitarization because these are, you know, militarism and colonialism are really baked into the fabric of, of this nation um, and, you know, into sort of our, our psyche as peoples in many ways. So that's, that's a, it's a big goal, but that doesn't mean that we're not, you know, living success every day in the work that we are doing. So I would say um, kind of in, in a broader sense, you know, we, we, the success stories have as much to do with, you know, repatriating our language. Um, we're seeing a really big language revitalization movement um, in Guam and, and off island throughout our diaspora, um, particularly throughout this pandemic with the availability of, of you know, resources and, and teaching from folks on island um, to bring our, our native language um, to our communities around the world. So. Um, the more that we're seeing, you know, also as a part of that work, really raising our community's consciousness about these options that maybe people haven't realized were available to us of, of you know, um, decolonizing or, um, you know, military abolition and things like that. Like these are, these are important parts of the success story as well. And I would say in particular context of science, I would um, point to the work for, for everybody here to look at of Sing, that's the Summer in Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics. Um, you can check out uh, their website online and they have a lot of publications from scholars who are indigenous, um, again, engaging in this kind of cross movement solidarity work to see that science you know, is um, engaging indigenous peoples in ways that are more reciprocal, more equitable, and, and also, you know, these are leading scientists in, in their fields in, in genomics and, um, you know, these are, these are people to follow and, and keep your eye on and, and support, excuse me, support in their work and, and cite in your own um, as much as you can as well. Perhaps I can add a quick story. Um, when I, I, I'm, I apologize because I'm forgetting the exact name of the nation, but in Australia, there's actually a very interesting success story. I mentioned the Square Kilometer Array, which is going to be a radio telescope built in the next decade to support European, Canadian, American astronomers. And it's being built on Indigenous territory in Australia. But when they went in, when the astronomers went in there, the Indigenous peoples walked them across the territory and basically told them where they can or cannot build. And they worked very closely to decide what areas had to be avoided, what areas could be used, and stuff like that. So there was I think this was a success in that it, it showed an attempt to respect land and re regardless of the per reason behind it and showed and created a principle of working together with the indigenous peoples of that territory. So I consider that to be a success story. Um, my own personal experience in Canada is we are way behind most of these success stories with the exception of people in Canada who work on things. You know, there are a dirt of people in STEM, in, indigenous people in STEM in Canada at the faculty level based on, our, we have very little demographic information, but based, based on uh, our research grants, you know, it's, we're underrepresented by a factor of 10. So we have a long way to go. Um, are there any more questions? Um, if, if not, then there's one I've been wondering. So I know you both started out with land acknowledgements, but while I at Oxford, for instance, am not on the land of any indigenous peoples to my knowledge, um, Oxford has definitely still benefited from the exploitation of land across the Americas. Um, do you have any suggestions for what maybe we at Oxford could be doing to acknowledge um, the things that we've taken since we're not technically sitting on somebody else's land. 
Great question. I think that one thing I've heard increasingly about land acknowledgements is sort of a call, weaving in a call to action, um, particularly for, you know, material support of, in some cases, the indigenous uh, communities whose lands you're on. But in your case, you know, maybe you could frame some of those um, colonial relations you've talked about, some of that imperial history. And if there are ways in particular that that still plays out today, framing that for people to kind of um, acknowledge that, you know, colonialism is, is something that didn't end necessarily with, you know, um, colonizers leaving a region, but continues through all of these sort of um, complex interlocking systems of oppression. I think for us, you know, when we are in a settler nation state, it's important for us to assert that we are in the lands of peoples who, who still exist and who are here today. Um, and that we're kind of living that act of settler colonization every single day by being on those lands. But yeah, for you, I would think, you know, framing some of that history and in the ways that you can, how it still plays out. And then again, tying it to, you know, material actions that can be taken. I've seen more people talking about um, sharing, you know, where people can uh, redistribute their wealth and donate to different kind of um, indigenous community funds or projects. So those could be some things to do research about and share as well. Thank you. If I could, if I could build on that, um, I put it through looking at museums and what was taken. But I grew up in Newfoundland and the um, Scottish National Museum, I think in Edinburgh, uh, it, had, it held the bod two bodies of the Biafra people. And the Biafra peoples are an ex largely extinct indigenous nation that, from Newfoundland as well. And that their bodies are still being held there. Uh, there are plans to repatriate them to Newfoundland in the next couple of years, but that theft of bodies is, is pretty young, it's pretty consistent for many nations. I would also mention this other story, which is more about the time we're in. Uh, this week is American Thanksgiving, based on the story of the meeting of uh, the pilgrims with the Wapanong peoples. And then during that time, the Wapanong had their wapum taken, which is a belt that was very, part of their ceremony, part of their history, part of their being, was taken by English and sent to England, ostensibly to the royalty. So I think looking in museums, looking around and seeing where indigenous items are that were taken and have been repatriated, because they don't belong in museums, they belong to the people. Okay, um, I think we might have time for one more question if anybody else has anything to ask. Um, you can type it in the Q&A box. Um, if not, um, I'll just say thank you so much to both of our speakers. Um, I know I've learned a lot about um, these two very different areas of science, um, which still both manage to interact with Indigenous speakers, so thank you for speaking with us. Um, and good luck with indigenizing the rest of your fields. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, Lilia. <laughs>